Let's give the Lord a hand. God is good. Because he lives, we live also. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and smile. Helps your looks. <laughs> Isn't God been so good to us? Amen. Amen. Uh, how many appreciate the fact that God has enabled us to send our pastor to see what's going on outside of the four walls and a burden that's come upon his life and heart to give to missions and to see the gospel go from Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. It's so, thank you, Pastor Matt. We are so blessed to be pastoring by you and your wife. Amen. Thank you, you can be seated. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I, I've recognized over the years, I didn't realize it for a long, long time, because I was the one that was preaching, I was the one that behind the pulpit went out, you know, but I never realized my wife's ministry. I, I really never realized what she did when I was away. I had no idea. You know what I mean? But the older I get, and I look back, and, I, and some of the things that happened when I was gone, I said, really? Really? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it kept the church from blowing up. I mean, it was amazing, some of the stuff that my wife did. And I know that Sister Rachel's the same. Thank you, Sister Rachel. So, so appreciate you. Amen. Well, might as well put away my notes. I don't hardly use them anyway. But anyway, <laughs> I do have some notes, and hopefully I can... Read them. <laughs> Amen. Uh, could it put me in Isaiah 40, verse 7? Uh, this has been such a tremendous promise to me uh, and to you. Uh, I like one translation that says, Because the Lord God helps me, I will not be dismayed. I have set my face like a flint to do his will, and I know that I will triumph. We know that we can be winners and we will be winners because we're putting our faith and trust in God. Amen? Amen. Amen. The, 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 the reason you're going to have a great marriage is because you're trusting God. It's not your good looks. And ladies, it's not your great bod, but it's Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes we kind of get, we kind of mess it, you know. But uh, So I want to thank God because he's our helper today. Uh, I want to go to the book of Luke, and these are just some of the last things that Jesus said and did on the cross. I remember that one translation says that in Luke's gospel, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then they parted his garments and cast lots for them. And then the Bible says that the, in the, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. Now, for those of you who don't understand the tabernacle, this is basically where God lived, if I can use that word, among his people Israel, okay? And uh, so there was this tremendous tabernacle, and, uh, and there was one part of the tabernacle, it was just real small, but that's where they kept the Ark of the Covenant, and God's presence would be so there that during the day, a pillar of cloud at night, pillar, and, but it represented God and his presence. And so the Bible says, but there was, some, there was a veil at, that no one could go into that holy place except once a year a high priest could do that. Other than that, it wasn't open to the public. And so what the Bible says here, when the veil was rent, it signified that all, all of a sudden, anybody and everybody could come into the presence of God. You didn't have to be a high priest. You could just be a believer. It was, it was such a tremendous thing. And then another place the Bible says that uh, it was rent from top to bottom. This or this. Then he gave up the ghost. He died. But then the Bible says when he rose from the dead... The graves of many of the saints that had died were opened, and the saints began to walk around in Jerusalem. 
I mean, it was so powerful. But the, the key was, Father, forgive them. If there hadn't have been any forgiveness, there wouldn't have been a resurrection. Now, this has it's got to say something to us. And so, and I want to talk about forgiveness because when we forgive, it opens life. All of a sudden, things begin to take place. All of a sudden, the veil is rent. And the God behind the veil, the God of miracles, signs, wonders, the God, well, that's everything is available to us. And we make it available to others. Isn't that amazing to me? I said, wow, this is really amazing. And I, I think, wow, resurrection brought back to life. <laughs> you know, some of your marriages need to be come back to life. <laughs> Sometimes it's your, it's your person. You, you just, you feel like there's, there's death and you need to come back to alive. Amen? I mean, families. How many families? You know, when you see the Hallmark movies, a lot of times the families are perfect. But some says, well, what happened to my family? <laughs> well, maybe we need a resurrection in our families, in our marriages, amen? In the church. There's a lot of churches that need resurrected. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is seen on the outside of a church knocking. And what are you doing out here, Jesus? Well, he says, I'm trying to get in church. He says, they've locked me out of the church. <laughs> Think about it. I just, wow, okay. But... Uh, I don't think we really fully realize how many marriages really could be made alive again. Families, churches, when we understand forgiveness. When we understand forgiveness. So I just want to talk a little bit about that this morning, if I could. Now, how often we should, should we forgive? Now, this is really amazing to me. You know, in the book of John... Uh, a part of it, it's the book of Matthew. And uh, the disciples said, how many times should we forgive? Seven times? I mean, that's, that's a lot. And he said, no, he said, I want you to forgive seven times 70 in a day. 490 times. I said, what in the world? Why is that so important? Why would Jesus say something like that? Because so much is tied to forgiveness. So much is tied to forgiveness. I thought, wow, this is amazing to me. How much, Jesus said, when you pray, he said, now listen, I want you to forgive or your father cannot forgive you. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, you know, that if we don't forgive, God doesn't forgive. What, what happens, that means that we don't get the life flow that belongs to us in Christ. We don't really, can, we can never really experience the resurrecting power that has been purchased for us through the precious blood of Jesus because we need to understand forgiveness. I like what it says in, um, in uh, uh, Matthew's gospel again in 18. This is really good. You ought to read it sometimes. It's uh, chapter 18, verses 23 through 35, and it's talking about uh, a, a king and uh, he said I'm, he was going to call all his servants and because some of them owed him money. And he said, I want to make, make an account. And here's a guy that owed him three times what he could make in a lifetime. I mean, the guy was really in debt. And, uh, and so the, the servant fell down and said, please, Lord, have mercy. Uh, and if you just have mercy, I'll, I'll try to pay you everything. Of course, he couldn't. But he said, Lord, have mercy. And the Bible says the king had mercy on that servant. No, <laughs> but that servant who had been forgiven went out and met a fellow servant that owed him a few bucks. And he took him by the neck. The Bible said he took this fellow servant by the neck and said, listen, you owe me. I want you to pay me now. And the guy, he did the same thing to this servant that the servant had done to his master. And he said, no, no, no way. No, no, no. You're going to pay me or you're going to jail and you're going to full the, pay the full price and you're not coming out. Well, the Bible says when other servants, the other fellow servants heard, they went to the master and said, do you know what happened here? And they really felt so bad. He said, here, this guy that you forgave, he went and he met another his fellow servant that owned a few bucks and threw him in jail. 
And so the Lord called that servant in. He said, listen, <laughs> you're a wicked servant. You're a wicked servant. Because I forgave you all your debt. You should have forgiven your fellow servant. You're a wicked servant. And he said, just for that, are you ready for this? You are going to be turned over to the tormentors. You're going to jail. And the, what I forgave you, no more. You owe everything now. You're going to go to jail and you're going to pay everything that you owe. And you're going to be delivered to the tormentors. And Jesus said, this is exactly what your heavenly father will do to you if you do not from your heart forgive all your neighbor his trespasses. So to me, no wonder he was so emphatic about forgiving 490 times in a day because he knew the penalty of not forgiving. He knew what was going to happen. You are going to be delivered to the tormentors. I said, well, Lord, who are the tormentors? Could you imagine who, the, who are the tormentors? Demons. <laughs> That's bad. That's bad. <laughs> when the demons are loose in your life, you got problems. Woo! I mean, I, I thought, I said, wow, the self-destruction of unforgiveness. It's incredible to me. And I said, could you imagine the suffering, the torment, the hell that awaits people who refuse to forgive. Do you know people right now, mental hospitals are filled with people like this. We're not talking about just something that's kind of just once under. No, no. This is right now. There was a doctor that met a preacher in the hospital. And the doctor said, listen, 80% of the people in this hospital don't need me. They need you. I mean, we have no idea physically. A lot of the problems physically are caused because we're unwilling to forgive. Hold that grudge. Ooh, I said, whoa, I, 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 this is not good. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I really don't relish having demons running around my house. I just don't. I, 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 all I've ever read about demons is they're bad. And they just do bad stuff, and they're causing problems all the time. They're always getting into your hair. It's horrible. It's horrible. And yet there are Christians, Christians, that allow this to happen. Well, I'm just going to ask Jesus to take care of No, no, no. There's some things he takes care of, and other things you've got to take care of. He says, listen, I'm going into hell, and I'm going to take the keys of hell and death, and the devil is going to be paralyzed, but... You've got something to do, and you have to resist him. And that's what you're going to be responsible for. I want to think. I said, wow. I said, this is unforgiveness keeps demons working in your life, your marriage, your family. <laughs> Forgiveness puts demons out of work. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, the devil can be working in your but if you're willing to forgive, you put the devil, he has to go on employment. He's out of work. Somebody said, that's kind of simple. That's, that's the gospel. I mean, some of this stuff that's so, you, you have to go to college, you got to do it. You know, if you can just forgive, it saves a lot of money on, on medication. I, I wonder how many people on medication because they don't understand forgiveness. There was a sign in the, a mental word on the wall. Read something like this. Do you want to get healed or just get even? Do you want to get healed or just get even? There's just some people just they hold on to that thing. <laughs> and I'm glad there's nobody here like that. <clears throat> but when we forgive, are you ready for this? The tormentor becomes the tormented. The tormentor becomes the tormented through your forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I kind of feel good about that. <laughs> forgiveness will neutralize the devil. Put him out of work. I, I, this is amazing to me. I said, wow. Satan cannot operate in the presence of forgiveness. 
Satan cannot operate. Now you think of all the problems that happen. Why are they happening? You have to kind of go back to the devil inciting your lower nature. But you can put him out of business. Somebody said Satan is bound by forgiveness, but we are bound through unforgiveness. Things don't work right. If we're unwilling to forgive, there's a lot of problems that we don't need or not necessary, but they're going to infect your life because, listen, I, I think of something that Jesus said, and he said, all power is given to me, but he said something else. He said, the devil is coming. He's getting ready for the, for the crucifixion. He's getting prepared to get ready to die. And he says, Satan is coming, but he has nothing in me. He has no rights over me, no holds over me, nothing common with me. Well, what is he saying? What's he saying? You have to go back to Genesis. When the Bible says that God <clears throat> told Adam and Eve, don't eat the garden, you know the story. And, of course, they ate. And then God came down, and he began to judge him. He said, he said ladies, you're going to have problems having babies. That's going to be your problem. And he said, Satan, you're going to crawl on your belly, and you're going to eat dust. And then he turned to the man and said, you're dust. This is one of the reasons we have to get born again, because the old lower nature, Satan has a God-given right to eat dinner at your house if you're going to be fleshly, be carnal, and you're going to do it your way, then Satan has a God-given right to eat dinner at your house. I, I, I mean, this, I don't know about you, but I, I don't like that idea. But that's happening. That's going to happen unless you are you're willing to forgive. <clears throat> you know, sometimes forgiveness is not always easy, and I thought about this. I thought, you know, Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of them. All he did was good. That's all he could do. And yet, <laughs> he was the one that was suffered and crucified. It was, it was horrible. Horrible what they did to Jesus. And yet, all he did was good. Could you understand that kind of forgiveness? Uh, it's very difficult for me. I don't know. But I thought to myself, I said, Wow. Therefore, I've got this written out because I really liked it. Therefore, in forgiveness, do not expect the other person to change. I'm, I mean, I, I know this guy that really got gloriously saved. He hated his father. He grew up in a terrible uh, situation, so he just actually hated his father. But when he got saved, he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to apologize to my father for whatever I did. It was his father that was a jerk, but he said, I'm going to apologize for whatever I did. And so he got ready to go, and I said, I said, listen, bro, please do not expect your father to have the right response. You do your job and leave it the rest up to God. So many times that's... <laughs> I don't know. We really expect, you know, well, they're going to really be a problem. No, no, no. It's not going to happen. I like this. Listen to this. Forgiveness is not going back and changing what happened. Forgiveness is not going back and changing what happened. Are you ready for this? But we are refusing to live in the past. We're refusing to go back and maul over the things, the hurts, the wounds, the injury, or the insults. We refuse to bring that to mind. No, we're going to live for the Lord. Whew. Boy, I'm glad that nobody in here has any problem with forgiveness. That's really, really nice. I mean, I think it's really great. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, <laughs> see some of the scriptures. I really like it by because the, the real Bible if all the Bible is so practical and livable. You know, a lot of the, what people are preaching, they're just picking out some good stuff. But every now and then, you need to read some stuff that's not quite as good as you'd like, but it really made a difference. Deuteronomy 23, 12, 13, and 14. Maybe we can put that up. <clears throat> Thou shalt have a place outside the camp where you can go abroad, and you're going to have a spade 
upon your weaponry. <laughs> and when you ease yourself abroad, thou shalt dig thereof a hole in the ground, and then you're going to cover it back up. Well, this next one's really good. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thee, listen, to deliver thee and give thine enemies over to you, listen, therefore, listen, shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing, that he turn not away. I like another translation. I mean, some of this stuff, go abroad, what's it mean? <laughs> You're supposed to have a place outside the camp where you take a door, where you go to the bathroom. That's what it means. And you're supposed to have a spade as part of your equipment. Because every time you have to relieve yourself, you've got to dig the hole and you've got to bury your excrement because I, the Lord, walks among you in the camp and I don't want to see any poo poo. I got white shoes on and I don't want to get them dirty. I don't know. I said, wow, that's, I like that the other translation is a little different. <laughs> but notice what it says here. If we can learn to forget those things that are behind, we're willing to bury the past through forgiveness, God guarantees his presence. And when God shows up, miracles happen. He can heal brokenhearted. He can make things right. He can, do, he can do whatever whatever needs to be done in your life to bring peace, love, and joy into your life. All things are possible as we are willing to forgive. I thought, wow, this is really... Here's another one. This is really good because um, in the book of Philippians, <clears throat> chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. Well, maybe you can put that up. Yeah, okay. Brother, I caught not myself to have apprehended this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, reaching forth unto those things that are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Whew. I said, that's really amazing. Forgetting. Now, I like the word forget because this is a really, really a good word here. Because it means to loose out of mind by implication to neglect. Forgetting those things that are behind. That's, he, and in fact, that's what he said. He says, for, the first thing I'm going to do, the most important thing, is I've got to learn to loose out of mind. I've got to forgive. I've got to neglect those things, those feelings, those thoughts that are so tormenting to me. What my father did or didn't do. What my mother did or didn't do. I think of all the wounds and all the, all the hurts and all the injuries that I felt emotionally. But this is what I'm going to do. He said, I am going to neglect those. How do you do that? Well, when the thought comes with pain, when the thought comes with the pain of how you're treated, mistreated, whatever, what do you do? You think another thought. No, you can't think two thoughts at the same time. So you don't sit there and say, I'm not going to think about it, I'm not going to think about it. I'm gonna. No, the more you say that, the more you're going to think. You have to know, no, you, what you do, you neglect that thought by thinking another thought. Thinking how good God is and how his mercy has been, how he's forgiven you, how he brings healing. How he's, you know, think of the good things. Neglect those things that are without. I like what one preacher said. If Satan can keep you in the arena of thought, he'll whip you. But if you can keep him in the arena of faith, you'll whip him. You think about it. If he can keep you thinking about that hurt, that wound, that, you know, whatever it was, you're, 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 you're going to be in trouble. He's going to win you every time. But if, on the other hand, you're willing to neglect that thought, close the door to that thought, and open the door to another thought, 
because you can't think two thoughts at the same time. I, don't you think that this warfare is a little simpler what some folks have made it? You go to some psychiatrist, psychologist, and, and they, it's so deep that, you know, you have to go to school to learn all that stuff. When, if you kind of go to the Bible, it's a little bit more simple to me. I mean, maybe, maybe you need something. I don't know. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling out of strongholds. And so God's given us this tremendous weapon of forgiveness. If you just use this forgiveness, you can conquer your foe. You, you, can, you can have peace of mind. You can have love, joy, peace, can flow like a river. I mean, this is going to be amazing. But if you think for a moment that a victorious Christian life is without struggle, you've got another thought coming. Because if you think for a moment... Your mind is going to let you think what you want. When he's been in control, it's going to be a problem. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to deal some stuff, you know what I'm saying? But if you understand that, wait a minute, my natural man, my natural mind is always opposed to the spirit. The Bible said the flesh wars against the spirit. They're not compatible. And so Paul said, this is the fight that I'm always fighting. There's, just, there's a Holy Spirit and the good thoughts, and then there's the devil and his thoughts, and my mind always wants to side with my old father. Well, I'm glad that doesn't you know. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling out of strongholds. And let me kind of close with something I thought was pretty good. Forgiveness is basically a promise. Here's the promise. When someone has hurt you, wounded you, whatever it is, number one, you're not going to bring that hurt, wound, whatever, up to them. You know, sometimes, well, let me tell you what you really did. Let me just tell you how you hurt, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 don't do that. Now, we're not suppressing, but we're committing things to the Lord. You know, there's a difference between suppression. You know, I'm just not going to think, no, 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 no. I'm going to commit it to God. God, you're the judge. You're going to have to care, take care of this. Uh, you know how I feel. That's, that's, your, that's up to you, but, but to, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to submit myself to you. I'm going to commit myself to you, and I'm going to trust you. So I'm not going to bring it up to you. I don't know, but this, this is really a temptation. I don't know. Sometimes when we've had little tiffs, you know, you know I, want, I, want to, I want to tell her. I want to talk to her a little bit about it. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, <laughs> it's so good. To <laughs> well, so instead of suppressing it, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to trust God with it. And then, I'm, to, I'm not going to talk to other people about it. Boy, oh boy, is this hard. Hey, listen, I just, I just want you to pray about something. <laughs> I'm not going to bring it up to you, and I'm not going to talk to others about it, and, listen, I'm not going to dwell on it myself. Whatever happened, I'm not going to dwell on that myself. I'm going to replace that kind of thinking with Bible thinking. Holy Ghost thinking, more than a conqueror. God always causes me to triumph. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm on my way to heaven. Glory to God. Remember the old nature is saying, you've got to be kidding. You know how you feel. Let's be real here. Flesh, shut up. You've caused me enough problems, and I'm taking, the Holy Ghost is taking over from here, and you're shutting your mouth. Well, Brother Mark, I, Matt, I think some folks, it, talk to some folks, but most of the folks are in here healed on their way to heaven. Glory to God. Hallelujah. They have no problem. Listen, if you're struggling, I suggest that you come for prayer. You don't have to tell the people what you're struggling with. That's not it at all. And they've said that many times here. If you're coming, you don't have to tell the whole story. All you have to do, I need prayer. I need somebody to agree with me. And as you come to prayer, anybody, anybody struggling with forgiveness today? 
I think of parents that were not good parents. I think of marriage partners that were just horrible. I think of friends that betrayed me. If you need forgiveness, please feel free to come stand here. And your standing here is saying to God, I need your help. I need to experience forgiveness and the wonderful freedom and liberty and joy and peace that comes. I need you, Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's give Pastor Matt a hand as he comes.